I'd like to introduce Dr. McCola, and we are going to be talking today about biohacks to improve mitochondrial function. Thank you so much for, you know, being here and talking about this today, Dr. McCola. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here, Kristen. Well, before we get started, can you share why you have so much passion to help spread the message of, you know, not just healthy lifestyle, but, you know, how did you even get into this realm of what you're doing today? Well, I've always been passionate about health and also passionate about technology, which is why, you know, I combined those two and it grew to be the most visited natural health website in the world for the last 20 years or so. <clears throat> but I don't know, it's just in the, when I was in grade school, I just be, was really excited about getting healthy. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> understand how to do it back then, but, you know, exercise was my first strategy and, you know, I completely fell into the low-fat diet myth, which really sabotaged my metabolism back then and, and uh, continued to suffer with that, those consequences for a long time, like many of us did. We didn't realize that the fraud and deception and misinformation that was being disseminated. But fortunately, you know, we have the 21st century and the Internet, and we can sort through all that confusion and figure it out for ourselves. And so... You know, today you have one of the largest uh, websites. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it's, uh, we, we have about 30 million unique visitors a month, so all over the world. And we have an opportunity to help educate people about the truth about health so that they don't need to be misled and deceived by the true fake news, which is the corporate media, which is controlled by six corporations that have 90% of the, the conventional news media. So they're always sharing the same messages, which is not aligned necessarily to telling the truth, but to really passing a corporate agenda that benefits their sponsors so, or them directly. So we, we, you guys we, are actually the truth. <laughs> You're not being bought off well, by <laughs> We're definitely, we don't have an, I mean, when I first started this site, a lot of people criticized me for selling things, but, you know, the first five years of the site, I didn't, we didn't sell anything. I was just there. Was, I basically paid for it out of, it was like half a million dollars after a few years and realized that we couldn't scale anymore without selling things. So we had to do it. So I just sold things that we use ourselves or, you know, would recommend. So, and that helps subsidize the, the, the overhead to spread the message. Well, I think that our listeners are just so, you know, I, I can't imagine them not being just so excited and honored to have somebody like you taking your time out of your, such a busy day to talk about biohacks to improve mitochondrial function. Yeah, yeah, that, that probably is a poor, you know, I think when I wrote that, I was like probably had 100 emails to get to. I just scribbled <laughs> really scribble that. But, but that's not, that really isn't targeted for your, maybe you even want to change it. It's, it, I mean, ultimately that's what it is. There's, that's totally truthful, but it's not necessarily intriguing or enticing to someone with a child with autism. Well, what, is, you know, what does a biohack even mean, you know, for the listeners out there? Well, just what it says, uh, you know, uh, like uh, people are computer with, com familiar with computer hackers. So that's someone who's expert in a, that technology can go in and manipulate and change things to their, their end, and a bio means it's in biology. So how you can improve your health with, you, with, with a deeper understanding of biology, essentially. And, and that's what's really, ultimately one of the core dis problems in autism is that these mitochondria are not working well. They're dysfunctional. And the mitochondria, for those who don't remember from biology, they're the, the cellular powerhouses. They're little... I mean, they outnumber our cells 100 or 1,000 to 1 because each one of our cells, almost every one of our cells, has about a few hundred to a few thousand mitochondria. <clears throat> they actually create the energy currency of our body called ATP. So when those go south, your health goes along with it. And if they die prematurely in significant numbers, you're dead. Because what? without water... Without food, you're dead in a few months, right? Mm -hmm. Without water, a few days. Without mitochondria, a few seconds. Oh, wow. That's it. You are gone. <laughs> you, wow. can't, you can't operate any tissues. They're all dysfunctional. And, you know, and I was reading before our interview that in 2010, there was a, um, a study by the University of California of Davis uh, 
California Davis to show that 80% of the children with autism spectrum disorder, um, they actually did, um, they enrolled in a study and had blood tests indicating that the mitochondrial was dysfunctional, which is just so crazy, right? Like, why aren't we talking right. more about this? You know, so for those listeners, especially for those new parents that, you know, or urban parents that have been around for a while with children with autism, this isn't something the traditional doctor, you know, are ta- they're not talking about this. So, you know, first of all, what role do you believe the mitochondrial function is playing with their kids, um, you know, with their, with their symptoms and, and that kind of thing? Well, it's responsible for a large majority of them, but then that sort of begs the question, well, what's causing the mitochondrial dysfunction? And mm-hmm. pretty much the, the factors that many people have heard and read about are the big issues, but there's, there's some tweaks, and some of them are new that some of your uh, listeners or viewers may not be familiar with, and that's what I wanted to share with you, with uh, your audience today. So ultimately, I've written a a book that comes out in May, and I'm not sure when this is going to be airing, but it comes out in the middle of May. It's called Fat for Fuel, which goes over some of the basic details on how you can improve mitochondrial function with your diet. Essentially, it's a it's, not, it's sim- similar to paleo, but it's more accurately, it's a cyclical ketogenic diet. So high fat, low carbs, and adequate protein, but not all the time because there's days you have to go through like feast and famine. To, and just with the food, you can have radical improvements. I know that's a challenge for many children, but you know, when you put them on a high carb diet, that's one of, one of the worst things you can do. Uh, not that they should be on low carb the rest of their lives, but but high carb continuously is very pernicious and will, will, premature, will de- certainly damage mitochondria. There's no question about it. It's been well shown. And so when we're list- the, you know, for the listeners out there, they're, they're thinking, okay, now, you know, what, are, what are some of the things that they can do? I mean, clearly what are, right. there has to be something okay. that they can do to help with this, right? Absolutely. So let's talk about some of those things. Uh, there's a number of them. One of them is, is to, to understand, well, toxic exposures is another big one. So what are toxic exposures? We have uh, EMF exposures, and we'll go into that in detail in a bit. And then we have metal toxins and environmental toxins like vaccines. So these are all pernicious influences on on our health and, and can and have devastated millions uh, and into developing some type of uh, complication and putting them on the, on auto, on the uh, uh, spectrum. So, and we, and you, I'm sure in some of your other interviews you're having that they discuss the scope of the problem. And Seth, Dr. Seneff is suggesting that within a generation or so, it can go as much as one in two or even if it's one in three, that would destroy the culture because there's just no way that a, a, a culture can survive with one-third of their population as autistic children because it takes more than one person to care for them. No kidding, so, right? <laughs> yeah. So I know, I know people listening are too interested in the future because they have problems they're struggling with now, so let's go back to that. So radiation exposure. There's three types of EMF that one needs to be concerned with. Uh, one is magnetic exposure, and these are typically from motors and appliances in your home. And you can get something like a tri-field meter, and it measures in milligauss. Ideally, they should, you know, you, it, and you can measure it uh, not just at waist level and walk around, but certainly at the, at the floor and go all the way up to, to the ceiling just to make sure there's no hidden wires or something giving you high reach. So it's really important to have a, a sleeping place that is free from or really low in, in these EMFs. So that's one, one component. And then you have dirty electricity, which is an artifact of electrical distribution. And there's where these spikes in these, uh, the current that can cause some very serious damages has been associated clearly with many types of uh, malignancies, especially in children. So there are filters that you can use for that, and there's actually meters. So just like everything, you want to have, be objective about it. You want to measure it and then remediate against it once you find it. So tri-field meter is easy. So like if you're the sleeping in a bedroom and on the other side of the bedroom is a refrigerator with a really heavy motor or... Uh, maybe you have solar panels and you have a, uh, 
a, a DC, AC, DC inverter, DC AC inverter in the garage, and their bedroom's right behind it. Well, you know, that would show up on the, on the trifield meter. And there's others. That's just a common one that you pick up on Amazon. It's like $150. Uh, and then there's other meters that you stick in the wall that will show you this dirty electricity. Fortunately, there are things you can do to remediate against that. It's about, oh, can be up to $1,000 depending on how big your home is, but there's these little filters that you plug into the outlets that have capacitors in there that uh, remediate against that, that artifact. And then the last type would be from our cell phones. Um, and it's getting worse. I mean, we had 1G, 2G, now we're at 4G, and we're going to be at 5G next year and probably widely deployed by 2020. Um, so that's just going to have a lot more bandwidth and a lot more potential for damage. So the key here is that, obviously, if you're talking on the cell phone and putting it next to your head, that's not a good idea, and, and most kids with, on the spectrum are not going to be doing that. So that's not an issue, but just living in an environment where the near cell phone tower, and they don't have to be near them, they're, they're just, it's pervasive. And there's meters, uh, like a good one is the Acousticom 2. Acoustic, just like the word sounds, and com, and then 2. It's about $200, and you could turn it on, and you can see exactly where it's at. And you'll see that, I mean, if you, unless you're like in some very remote rural area, like in the middle of a national park, you're going to have a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's just, that's the nature of living in the United States. So fortunately, there are things you can do to remediate against that, and that's like putting um, uh, a, a fabric canopy that's made of special material that typically has co uh, copper and silver threads in it that essentially forms a Faraday cage, with, which is amazing. It just does not allow any of that radiation into that space. It's just neutral and quiet. When you put the meter in there, it just goes silent, which is pretty amazing. So if your child can sleep in an in a, in a EMF-free um, space and maybe even ideally turn off the power to the room, then, you, then actually you wouldn't have to be worried about the dirty electricity because there's no power. There's no dirty electricity in the circuits, at least in that room. Um, that would be another way because you've got to have them sleep in a healthy environment. It's really crucial to repair and restore. Uh, and if they, if they aren't able to do that, then other toxins that they're exposed to in the environment, which are pervasive, like uh, just the food supply, uh, the vast majority of the food is contaminated with glyphosate. Even if it's grown organically, um, they, they spray like 5 billion pounds of this a year in the world every year and have been doing it for some time so obviously it gets into the environment it gets evaporated goes up into the clouds and it rains glyphosate so even if you have organic crops there's probably going to be contaminated with glyphosate which is uh, a really nasty way to play with your mitochondria and there's uh, Senef again has done a lot of studies showing the influence of Glyphosate exposure and autism, and it has some pretty compelling data. That doesn't seem fair to buy organic and, and then still be worried. You know what I oh, mean? Oh, I know. It's, it, I know, but it still has less. So that gets yeah. to the next question. So, I mean, obviously you want to buy organic. I know you, it, it, because even if it, it'll have less glyphosate, but I'm just saying that to, unless you're growing it yourself in a greenhouse, <laughs> you know, yeah. the rain Which we contaminated. All <laughs> <laughs> Which obviously it sounds like we're all going to have to start growing our own food pretty soon. <laughs> well, I, I, grow, I grow a big percentage of my food, but it's still contaminated, you know, and I don't yeah. put any glyphosate on my property. So, uh, but fortunately, it's relatively easy to mitigate against if you're healthy, oh, that's good. you have a good okay. microbiome. So when you're eating the right foods, see that one of the other goals is to make sure you have the healthiest microbiome and gut microflora that you can have because they are they're, they're really crucial for helping. The, all the signaling pathways that go in the body and help regulating health. So that's why if you have a good diet, you have a health, good uh, um, health-promoting bacteria rather than disease-causing pathogenic bacteria. So, and lots of good vegetables, of course, organic, and the fibers will go and serve as a good fuel for them. And then when you're not having sugar and, and foods that turn to sugar real rapidly, then you're not feeding the disease-causing uh, bacteria, yeast, and fungi. So uh, getting back to the glyphosate issue, you can 
detox that uh, and repair some of the problems. Uh, there's a variety of ways. Uh, and one of them, I, I don't. I stopped seeing patients about 10 years ago, so I don't have direct clinical experiences. But one of my good friends is uh, Zach Bush, who's developed this product called Restore. And I think it's becoming more popular in the autism community. Have you heard of that before? Yeah, um, I actually just yeah. met with some of the people at the booth um, at the Soho at the Natural Products Show in Florida, and then yeah. I went out and bought some, and we're we're trying it right now. So I'm. Uh, yeah, yeah. It looks like it's, a great it's, product. It's very- yeah, you just have to start really slow if you have a seriously damaged child. I mean, really, like a few drops, and then work your way up from there. But the, 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 the product is designed to repair intercellular communication and, and uh, the tight junctions that get damaged by ingestion of glyphosate. So that's a, a very simple thing to try. And if you're having a low dosage, it's not terribly expensive. It's like $70 for a quart, which might last a few months, depending on how much you're using. So that's something to consider. We don't sell it. It's just, he's a friend of mine, and I, I, think, I love his work. Um, and then just regular detox. So I just spoke at uh, Dr. Klinghart's um, event last week and uh, had a chance to hear his presentations again. It reminded me of some important components and, and got some good updates, too. Um, there is a... A simple way to do this, and if you heard of the, the, the ionic foot baths? Yeah, actually, one of our um, partners um, is Ion, uh, is, um, it's, it's an actual Ion foot bath, um, and um, we it, actually have is one. It, is, it, is that Ion Cleanse? Yep, that's, our, that's, the, that's one of our partners okay, at Optimum yeah. Alliance. Yeah, that's one of our sponsors. Yeah, so, yeah, well, I would endorse that, too. I mean, I mean I, again, I don't have any clinical experience with it, but from the study, the data I've seen, it seems to be really compelling. And we actually wrote an article about seven or ten years ago uh, really debunking that whole process. And, and it was a good article. It was, I think it's still valid because the majority of these foot baths don't work. They may be, may be problematic. So uh, the ion cleanse is a more expensive version. It's like $2,000. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's kind of pricey. I mean, you can go to a clinician and get it done, too. Like you can also rent them, too. Um, I, I own okay. one, but you can also rent okay. them. And so that's um, really helpful for families out there if you guys are interested. Yeah, and, and, and that's the confusion. That w- the reason why we debunked them initially is that the thought many years ago was that the, was believed that the toxins were excreted in the water that your feet are stuck in, and that's not the case. It actually comes out in the urine like three days later. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, I didn't either. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I went with, listened to Dr. Klinger's lecture. But that's, he, he, the studies have done, in fact, the company knows that and they can show you the literature. Now, you only probably have to do it like twice a week or so, I think, typically. I mean, how often are you doing More than twice a week? Um, well, each protocol is a little different. So with our son, five days a week. But some people do it two okay. to four times. It just all depends. Yeah, okay. So it's pretty, I mean, the only consumable there are the steel plates that you have to replace. But that appears yeah. to be the best. As far as I can tell, they are, if you're going to do it, that's the one. In fact, I got one for myself. Um, so that's useful. Now, there's uh, some other things you can do around that. That has to do with the introduction of light. And light is very powerful, and most clinicians, almost all clinicians don't understand it. It's photobiology. And you can really improve everything you're doing with an optimal diet and detox strategy just with simple light. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's go and start with the detox. First is an infrared sauna. Now, my favorites would be a tent sauna so that your head is not in the sauna. It's out. Uh, and you, you can easily, they can fit children or adults, depending on what size chair you put in there. So you put like a little stool for a child and a really small chair for a large adult. But uh, I like to head out because there's no reason to head your head has to be that hot. And typically you go for about 30 minutes or so. Uh, you build up to it, tolerance. Uh, but it's far infrared, and when you, it, when you use one, you want to make sure it's low EMF because that's the problem. Uh, that uh, there's a lot of cheap ones out there that don't pay attention to that, and then you're going to have the, the high milligrams. You can, again, you can easily check that with a tri-field meter. Uh, you should check it. I mean, even if they say it's low EMF, they might be lying. You know, a lot of companies do that. <laughs> yeah. Sad, sadly. So then the other component, and then ideally 
you would do the ion cleanse after the, the, the sauna. So, because that liberates it. And, and the, the, now, many people have heard of the, the infrared sauna, but another improvement upon that is the use of near infrared. Because the infrared sauna, they never, hardly ever say it, but it's far infrared. And that has a far uh, longer wavelength. And near infrared does something very, very special to the mitochondria. Um, and, the, and red light will do this too at about 660 nanometers, and the, and the near infrared is about 830 or so. And that what that will do is will uh, there are there's a protein in the inner mitochondrial membrane, the cytochromes. This is I think it's the fifth, and the, the first and the fifth I think of it. That have these cytochromes that are chromophores. They have they have absorbed this frequency. And when they absorb it, this energy gets transferred to the mitochondria, makes it far more efficient, and produces more energy and ATP, and repairs the cell damage. It helps repair it. It's amazing stuff. And uh, I can't say this on my site because of uh, FDA and FTC restrictions, but I can say on an interview is uh, we're actually coming up with some of these things. But you can right now you can go to to Amazon and pick up a, a near-infrared illuminator, security illuminator. Uh, and you can pick up, you can get it for as low as $6, but I, got, I like one that's about a little bit under $70. It has 192 of these near-infrared LEDs. And you, that's a perfect complement for the far-infrared sauna. And you can do it like for, actually what, what Dr. Klinger is doing, he's using these for like about a minute or, t- or two uh, and he, he muscle tests for him to see what the right dose is. But just a relatively short amount of time. And it actually, he has a protocol that he uses to treat Lyme disease. And, you know, Lyme disease, the treatment for Lyme disease is treatment for almost, almost all cross diseases, including autism. So it's not much different. You know, it's the same issue. You've got these bugs in there and you have to liberate them. They get stuck in the tissues. And, and infections are probably a, a problem with um, autism too because, the tissues get damaged and they, you know, they're because they're, the systems aren't operating properly, then, then the bugs take over so that you have to liberate them. So one of the ways you do that, uh, one of his protocols involves this use of an ultrasound, but you can do it easily or more effective and simply and less expensively with, a, with this infrared device. So you just put it on these areas around your body. With this device I'm talking about, it's about mm, six inches by four. So for a child, it wouldn't take much to treat the whole body in a few minutes. Uh, and you do that, and then you go into the far infrared sauna and to help, to help facilitate the detox. So, uh, and then you go into the ion cleanse. And, you, and, then it, and it needs to be used with the binder, too. You just can't, ideally, you want to bind these things. You can use things like chlorella or certain types of zeolites, you have to be careful on the zeolites because it's, it's like aluminum silica and some of the zeolite products have too, way too much aluminum and, and actually, that's actually one of the dangerous metals that we have to get out because most of us, it's one of the more poisonous metals. The aluminum and mercury and lead would be the big ones. So, but this whole process will help, you know, if you, if you lower the radiation exposure, because if, you've, if, you're, if you have this radiation, the dirty electricity, the, the cell phone exposure, or the high MS due to electrical appliances in your house, um, then that's going to impair your body's ability to liberate these toxins and pathogens. So you gotta, that, that's really an important part of the whole process. And of course, eating the right foods, which is key. Now, getting back to light, um, this is a biohack that everyone listening should apply to themselves, not only their children on the spectrum, uh, but that is the pernicious damage of exposure to unopposed blue light at night. Now, what the heck does that mean? That means that the U.S. government in its infinite wisdom decided to ban incandescent bulbs. And they did it for a good reason. They're very energy inefficient. Uh, maybe suck up 20 times more energy than, a, than an LED bulb. So we saved a lot of money with uh, those bulbs on energy for sure, but at, at a price that, to our health that is really significant because for as long as humans have been around, except for, for the last 100, 150 years or so, the only light we ever had at night 
was like moonlight, starlight, or a fire, thermal fire. And even moonlight is reflected sunlight, so it's still thermal energy. It's fire, essentially, is what you're, that what you're viewing things on. And up until, I would say, the 90s or so, well, before then, we had fluorescence. But, you know, when fluorescence came in, and then the LEDs are even worse, you don't, that's not a fire light. That is a digital light. It's not a, that's not a analog uh, thermal light source. So as a result, you get these peaks. Uh, and with the fluorescence and LED, most LEDs, it's uh, the blue, and there's virtually... There's a blue and a yellow or a green, and there's virtually none in the red or the near-infrared. And it's the near-infrared and the red that balances out the blue. So that's why an incandescent bulb, I mean, 90% of the energy is, is, is near-infrared <laughs> or, 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 or even mid and far. So it's, that's why, it's, but you can't see with that. If you, if you get that uh, security illuminator from Amazon, you'll see when you turn it on at daytime, you won't even see it. Oh, a, a point on that, it has a photo electrode on it at the bottom, and uh, it's, it's not designed for a human use. It's designed to light up at night when the cameras are, want to use the lights as, as a light source. So you have to put a piece of black tape over that, otherwise it won't come on in the daytime. Um, it's, you know, there's not an on-off switch for it, in other words, if it's in the day. So you, just a little tip. Uh, I almost forgot about that. Because so, you, you can't, at night you can see the light come on. You can see it, if there's, but you will not see the light in the daytime because the regular daylight obscures the, 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 the near infrared in our visual pathways. So, um, but that, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, let me see where I was going with that. Oh, so... The, so the consequence of this artificial light exposure that we almost all have is, is pretty simple and easy to remediate. You, first of all, you have to go, hopefully you still have some left of the incandescent, old incandescent bulbs in your house. And those are really the only bulbs you should turn on at night. Now, it doesn't have to be that. You could use candles. Candles is actually even better than an incandescent light bulb. It just doesn't throw as much light. But it's even better. Obviously, you want to use a healthy candle source because a lot of them are toxic. They've got lead in the wicks and other. What about the candles that are like the battery operated ones? Are those no, no good? No, 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 no. It's the same thing. It's an LED light source. Oh, really? Oh, it's, yeah, they are. It's, it's, not, it's, not that, it's not that it looks like a candle, it's that the fact that what is the source of the light? The light has to be true thermal, fire. If it's fire, then it's okay. You got know? it. But if it's, a, if it's an LED, I mean, you can get warm LEDs, and they're better. They're not as dangerous, but they're still not good. The you know somebody listening down. was thinking of those candles, though. I know if I was. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I, I thank, thank you for clearing it up. I, I, you know, I used to have a bunch of those, but, uh, you know, it's an easy confusion. Yeah. So you want the real deal. So the other thing that you can use, I mean, because you're going to be in places where you don't have that type of control, but most of the time you're going to be at home, especially if you have a child on the spectrum. You're not going out a lot, I would imagine. So you, like, you don't have to change all the bulbs in your house. Like the rest of them that you use occasionally, that's okay. To leave them alone. The closets or, you know, laundry room or the garage, you're not in there too long. But just the ones that you, that 95% of the time that you're using, those are the ones that should be incandescent. It's the only thing you want to look at at night. So what the other sources are your TV, and your computer monitor for your computer monitor and your there is a uh, or desktop monitor there is a, a piece of software called Flux that many people have heard of. There's one even better called Iris I R I S Iris Mini. You can just type that in a Google browser and look it up, and it's like two dollars. But it really more carefully controls the brightness and the and the flicker rates to give you a healthier screen so that you're not exposing, because the, the light coming from your computer monitor is very dangerous. Even in the daytime, you don't want to do that. You want to turn it down because it's not balanced. And, if you're, and you're staring at it, it's going right into your retina and causing damage. I mean, most people don't realize it, but you know, I'm pretty good at making some of these predictions. It's one of my talents. Uh, you know, I call things out a long time before they became popular. Uh, and this is another one that's going to, um, tragically, unless we were able to educate a lot of people, is going to be an issue is that there's going to be an epidemic of age-related macular degeneration, which is the most common cause of blindness in the United States. So that could easily, and it's because of this exposure to this artificial 
blue light. So you can remediate against that by using these types of blue light blockers on your screen like Iris Mini. And then also at night, when the sun is down, we were never designed to be exposed to blue light at night. It just never happened before 150 years. It just never existed. You couldn't do it. <laughs> there was if no you, cable boxes to, back then? <laughs> no. Well, no, or no. There were no light sources that generated it. Yeah. You, if yeah. your life depended on it, you could not expose yourself to blue light at night. You couldn't do it. So you figure for however long as a human has been on the planet, that's never happened. So you can imagine that, that our system, our biology is not designed for that. So you can get blue light blockers. And these are cheap ones. They're like 10 actually $8 on Amazon. Uh, it's called UVEX, U-V-E-X. And they, uh, I think they fit over glasses even, but uh, they are very, very effective. I mean, they will block all the blue light out. They don't look, they're not cosmetically elegant, <laughs> but uh, they work. They work. So you can get it for the whole family and protect them. So, you know, when you're, and I wear them when I drive too. They're, I call them reverse sunglasses. You know, so I, when the sun goes down, I put them on. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're in your house, you know, but I put them on even my house, you know, too. I mean, because typically, you know, as soon as sunset comes, I've got my glasses on. That's it. That's, that's my personal rule. Um, I, you know, I guess there was an environment if it was, they just had candles, that'd be okay. Uh, but you know, that's, that's what I typically do. So, and so you can get that on Amazon. You said it was UVEX? UVEX, right. UVEX Blue Blocker. So the, 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 this is uh, information that e even many litter physicians and autism treatments wouldn't be aware of, but it may have profound influences on, on the, the treatment protocols. And it's simple, you know, just it's simple, maybe not. It's easy for, for, for sure, and it's relatively inexpensive. And the near infrared is, I think, is going to be the emerging new concept of how to add tr treatment therapies. In fact, we're, we're, right now, there are many studies being done that show clear effectiveness in the treatment of the opposite of autism, which is Alzheimer's, which is, happens on the, the other end of the spectrum, right? And brain damage. Well, this, this infrared light just passing through the skull, which would probably be another good place to put it, have could have enormous benefits and actually is reversing many of these patients with Alzheimer's. People who are on uh, dialysis and on the, on, on the list for transplants, they're finding they're able to get them off the transplant list just put them over their kidneys. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Now, it works even better if you integrate all the other strategies we talked about and probably many of the other ones that your other speakers are going to talk about too. So, but, you know, foundationally, most of the diseases we're exposed to are related to uh, really dysfunction in lifestyle and environmental exposures. So if you can correct that, it will treat just about any disease. Now, there's obviously some individual customization and customization protocols and treatment strategies, but for the most part, if you just apply the journal, you're going to see magnificent improvement. And, you know, I've been treated autistic patients for 15 years or more now, but it, it provided, I just got a great joy out of seeing children regain their ability to communicate and become verbal again and, you know, actually go back to school and even graduate, you know, from college. You know, I've seen many of my patients do that. So do you, great, does it matter the age? Does it matter the age that you, um, you know, because some of our kids are a little bit older, like my son's, you know, 15. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, no, no, there's, you know, and it just, uh, I'm, uh, there are some strategies that work even better when the children are older. And I'm, I, I just remember reading that one last week or two, and I just don't remember what specific one it was. But I would never give up hope. And these things do work, you know, and especially the photobiology is, yeah, that's something that is probably a strategy you haven't heard about before, is near infrared. Uh, no, I haven't. Very, very useful. Because I own uh, an infrared, but I've never heard of the near well, infrared is the infrared is the generic. Infrared is composed yeah. of three basic spectrums: the near, mid, and far. So it's the near that where the is the magic. Far is really for detox. It has some benefit too. It structures your intracellular water. And then just the other thing with light is to get outside. Imagine that. To get outside, <laughs> you know, expose as much of your skin as you can. And if you're, a, you know, if an infant, you can expose the whole body. They could be naked outside and not get a ticket or get arrested. <laughs> uh, you know, that's fine. 
but you know, obviously you never get sunburned. We're approaching summer, so you have to be careful and cautious. You never want to overdo it. Too much of anything is going to, probably going to be problematic. So just regular sun exposure is very healthy. And the other thing you can do uh, is another biohack that's relatively inexpensive is something called cold thermogenesis. So uh, especially if, it, if whoever you're treating is overweight, this will radically increase something called beige and brown adipose tissue, which is uh, brown adipose tissue called BAT. All the moms right now, they're listening. All the moms right now are going, okay, oh, wait, what did you just them. say? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a ve- it's a very simple biohack. You know, well, with two out of three people overweight in the country, it's, you know, I wouldn't want to know about that. But it's a simple biohack where you... Uh, expose yourself. You could just, just as simple as when you do your shower. You know, it's really maybe one of the most challenging things to do to turn that shower handle all the way to cold. <laughs> but you do it, and then you know it's it's a challenge. You know, for a few seconds, but then you build a tolerance to it, and then you shift it back to hot. And you just alternating hot and cold, hot and cold. Even better is to dive into a pool like where I live now. I've been doing this all, all year, and actually in the winter it got down to, I live in Florida, so it doesn't get too cold, but it was getting to the mid-40s, and I don't know if you ever jumped in a pool in the mid-40s, but it's cold. That's cold, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, uh, but anyway, you don't do that right away, you work into it, you may start in the 70s, 60s, and 50s, and you work your way down, but that's a powerful strategy, and you know, most of us um, really are in a comfort zone, and we've been so for like our Humans, just like the light, for the last 100, 150 years. How long have we had, you know, uh, in, indoor heating and, and cooling? We just, you know, it's, not a, it's a relatively recent innovation. So normally our species was exposed to these pretty extreme environmental shifts, unless you were, lived in the tropics. So it, as a result, uh, our physiology and our body is, is adapted to that type of swing. And when we don't do it, we lose this metabolic flexibility. And one of those things is this brown fat. And brown fat is, full, why is it brown? It's brown because it's full of extra mitochondria. What do mitochondria do? They burn fat really well. So, you know, the, the, the details of how to improve your um, dietary changes are in the Fat for Fuel book, and it's, it's definitely a great resource. It's now, how long do you simple- stay... How long do you stay in the cold water, though? Because you didn't go over that part. So you oh, turn the yeah, cold yeah, all the way. So now, how long do you stay there for? <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe 30, 30 seconds a minute, and they kind of alternate back and forth between the two, and then always end on cold. It's okay. a great strategy before you go to bed. But, but that, that will, that's a simple biohack, easy to do. You know, you and don't you can have do to that every day. A, it, oh, yeah, absolutely. You don't have to jump. Some, some things you shouldn't do every day. Like you shouldn't do the ionic cleanse. You're not even doing it every day. No. You shouldn't. I mean, I actually, I do most, actually, a lot of things that I do, I'd like to do every day, but I can't because I travel. So I'm you not know, bringing my sauna with me. I'm not doing this other <laughs> stuff. So, but I do an infrared sauna pretty much every day, and I jump in my pool. And this morning, the pool was like 60 or 61, which is still pretty cold. It'll definitely give you a jolt when you're in there for 20 minutes. So and that's, a, that's a powerful thing that we all need. Even, and I'm not overweight, but I just do it to improve metabolic health. So, um, but you don't have to ju- jump into an ice cube or a, a bathtub filled with ice cubes. It's not necessary because <laughs> to, to, the, to go to that extreme. But uh, it's, a simple, it's a simple thing to do. And you could look it up online, cold thermogenesis, and there's a, or go to YouTube, there's a lot of different more details on it. Uh, just to be aware that it's a concept that many people aren't, aren't utilizing and could really improve your mitochondrial health. Simple thing. So basically, it doesn't matter the age, you're constantly being able to kind of restore your mitochondrial function, you know, I don't know, back to original state, but at least being able to help, to help it regardless if it has been damaged. Is that, is that that's what it sounds yes, like? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, these same strategies work. I mean, most of the people listening to this have a child with autism, but they may have a parent with Alzheimer's. It's the same strategy that's going to work. It's identical. You know, it really is. You've got to get rid of the metals like aluminum, mercury, and lead. So you have to go through the detox. You have to limit the exposure to EMF. <clears throat> you have to optimize the diet. And you can use biohacks with, with the light and with uh, cold thermogenesis. And exercise, of course. But, you know, that to have a child engage in an exercise program is probably not going to be a really easy strategy. But for an adult, it's certainly something that's useful.
Now, you know, if I'm a parent listening, um, I'm thinking to myself, what symptoms am I looking for? How, like, how do, is there testing? Like, how do I know my child has a mitochondrial, uh, you know, basically dysfunction at this point? Are there signs and symptoms? Well, that's, are there testing? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. There, there are no specific tests outside of a laboratory that can measure these things. I mean, you can do uh, electron micrograph. I mean, these are really cells. These are inside the cell. They're not it's outside the cell. So, I mean, you can see it really, and this also works for cancer. You know, one of the two men listening to this will get cancer in their life and one of three women will. And that is not skin cancer. That is not including skin. We're talking serious cancer. So wow. it's the same dysfunction. So you can assume that if you have cancer, it's almost 100% guarantee you have mitochondrial dysfunction. That was the initial motivation for me to write this book. But it's the same, it's the same issue for everything else. You know, these mitochondria are poison. They're poisoned by the heavy metals, aluminum, uh, you know, that's just pervasive in our environment. It's being sprayed in, the, in, in geoengineering sprays. So it falls on the earth. You're exposed to it. So you get that. You get the, the mercury from the mercury fillings you had or the fit seafood you're eating. Uh, and then lead from the leaded gas has been, that means we don't have any more, but it was around for 50 years. And contaminated the environment like crazy. So these poison your biology and your mitochondria specifically. So if you have some type of dysfunction, you can almost be assured that the mitochondria are at the core of it. And you're going to hear more and more about that in the future as more physicians begin to appreciate this and to study it and to actually uh, seek to implement interventions. And I, I, ha- I don't think there's been... I was trying to look this up this morning, but my guess is that one of the reasons that these EMF exposures and, and microwave frequencies uh, that you get through cell phone towers are so dangerous is because they poison the mitochondria. They actually damage them. And they're getting these signals, the frequencies that are never designed to be exposed to. And that's why you need the silence. It has to be quiet. That's why you have to be in this uh, neutral cage at night when you're sleeping. You're not exposed to any of this noise that gives your body time to repair and recover. It's just like exercise. You know, a lot of people think exercise is great. It is. I mean, you need it. But the actual exercise itself is damaging. It causes harm and damage when you do it. But the beautiful thing is that it is necessary because it's, the magic occurs in the recovery afterwards where you actually become healthier and stronger. And if you didn't exercise at all, you'd be, just, you'd be even worse than, than not exercising. So it's the, the repair and recovery phase where most of the magic occurs. Now, what kind of outcomes, um, because I'm thinking as you're talking, like I know several years, my grandmother's passed, uh, oh gosh, that's almost seven years ago now, and prior to her passing, she lived with us the last two and a half years of her life, and she has, she had Alzheimer's, and, and then my son had autism, so I really was living in a world with, on both sides of yeah. the spectrum, which is what it felt yeah. like, and I, a lot I, of... I suspect <laughs> many, of your, many of your other viewers are too. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, um, it was an honor to be able to, to take care of her, um, but at the same time, you know, I, I always felt like there were so many things we were doing for our son that I felt was also for her, like, it was really helpful. And for her, you know, I can only do so many things because I couldn't get her into a hyperbaric oxygen chamber and I couldn't get her into the infrared sauna because she just wouldn't go in. But, you know, I really focused on water and clean foods and, and some other mm-hmm. things. And, you know, as well, I'm thinking... Well, you could have you used, used infrared lights. <laughs> Yeah, if I would have known about that, gosh, I would have loved to have done they that. A, they actually have, a, they have, a, they have transcranial infrared lights that's being used in research, and they, but they cost like $1,600. I'm just suggesting something that costs $70. <laughs> to well, I like the $70. You know, for me, it's like, you know, if you ch- I, I'll try anything that is not going to hurt somebody, right? And especially if it's not a yeah, lot yeah. of money but and like, a huge investment, you know? Right, right. I mean, light doesn't hurt you too. too I mean, it can. You can get sunburned, but, you know, if you use it wisely, it's not going to hurt you. Yeah, and if for something for $70 that you can at least try, I think these are all great options. Now, my question, though, is, you know, what is the outcome of the treatments? Like, how, when, when would we see some, start seeing something positive um, come about from that? Like, how long does it take for the mitochondrial function to kind of rejuvenate, if for lack of better terms? Well, that, no, no, that is a great term, it, and that's actually what they do. There's two processes that go on. It's called mitochondrial biogenesis, which is mitochondria actually reproduce themselves, and there's mitochondrial autophagy or mitophagy where they actually kill off the bad ones and damaged ones. So there's this constant repair and renewal process. And the, uh, so that does, your body can recover is the point of that, but how soon can it recover? It 
it, it, that's a great question, but it, there is no specific answer because it depends. It depends on how damaged they are to begin with, how, how severe, how pathologic is the process. What are the causative factors? You know, how many toxins do you have on board? What's your EMF exposure? Is your diet right? You know, do you have your light exposure? Well? So, it, it, you know, when the more of these you integrate, the better. Well, another important part of the, of the diet, I kind of skipped over the diet. Usually that's my passion, you know, is the diet, but, it, you know, it's just not as crucial here. And I just didn't, I, you know, a lot of people have heard about that anyway. I just wanted to add new things. But with respect to the diet, it is crucial. And I know that a lot of kids with autism have these eating challenges, but they have to get DHA. DHA is a very specific fat. It's from, primarily it's like from seafood. Uh, some people try to get it from uh, plants like hemp or flax or chia, but that has a very a smaller um, omega-3 fat, which is ALA, and it's only 18 carbons, and, and DHA is 22. So that's going to, from ALA to EPA and then to DHA, and the conversion is really, really poor, especially in someone who's metabolically damaged. So ideally, the best way to get DHA is from seafood. Uh, or like a cod liver I mean, oil, maybe? No, no, not, no, no, uh, that's not the best way. The best way is real seafood, clean seafood, okay. one that's not contaminated with mercury, dioxins, PCBs. So uh, the, the, and there's not many fish that do this. Wild Alaskan salmon one, is one. The other would be um, small fish like sardines, which is really inexpensive, but maybe not palatable for many kids. But that would be an ideal source. That's my primary source of DHA is sardines. If failing that, you could take supplements, cod liver oil is one, fish oil is another. Those are both in a triglyceride form, so they're not as well absorbed. I like krill as a little better form uh, because it has, it's attached to a phosphate and you get higher absorption and better penetration, especially to the brain tissues. So, but I still think seafood is the best because it not only doesn't have the DHA, but it has these micro minerals from the ocean that you never have a, probably even heard of that are in nanogram amounts that you'd never get anywhere else. So you're going to get the micro minerals plus they have these other things called resolvents and protectants that aren't in fish oils or krill or cod liver oil that are in the food itself that have uh, metabolic magic that once you uh, eat them and they radically reduce inflammation and disease processes. So a regular source of seafood is just crucial. It's so important for repairing the brain. And it works like magic too because when you take the child out into the sunshine, it's a real sun, then, then that DHA forms this something called the photoelectric effect where the photons from the sun, especially if the child is on the ground, grounding, not on wood or not on asphalt, but on the real earth, hopefully not sprayed with glyphosate. Um, <laughs> and then you've got the electrons from the earth, the photons from the, from the sun, and they go into, they create this biological circuit, and the DHA that gets incorporated into the mitochondrial cell membranes actually absorbs those photons and, turn, and through this photoelectric effect, converts them to DC electric current. So that's another part of the equation. It's really, really important. So getting all of that together, obviously don't put sunscreen on your child. You don't want to do that. Just want to get them to the real sun. The exposure to sun damage is, the, is, 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 is that, it's the exposure. So you just limit the exposure. Put a shirt on if they're getting too much or, you know, put them in the shade. But, you know, they need regular sun exposure. It's key. It's like common sense stuff, you know. It's like yeah, you don't put yeah, them out the there for an hour, an hour, but if you're out there for 20 minutes, you know, then you get under a tree or you get under an umbrella or yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah, and for, and for some kids for who are Irish and are completely white and they're going out to a vacation in the, in, you know, in the subtropics, then, you know, it might be three minutes. Yeah. You know, you don't want to overdo it. You never get yeah, I'm, think, I'm thinking of my olive, my olive kid. He can probably handle a good 20 minutes to an hour. But you're right. If you're red hair, freckles, and very pale, probably you, you could probably only handle a small amount of time. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's not that they're deficient anyway. They just don't need any more. Their body's telling them that's enough because they don't have this pigment, which serves as a filter block that, that would help them. You could actually, astaxanthin is an interesting supplement too. It's a, really the most potent bioflavonoid and a phenomenal or not by a uh, carotenoid is what I meant to say, uh, available and really helpful to prevent age-related macular degeneration, but also serves as an internal sunscreen. Now, it won't completely prevent sunburn, but it will certainly reduce, it'll increase the time at which you get a sunburn. So if normally you get a sunburn in 10 minutes, it might make it 20. Oh, so, that's cool. Yeah, 
Yeah, and it's, it's a very useful supplement. Um, it's typically extracted from, from algae. And the algae use, produce it actually to protect themselves from the sun. So, and it's the most potent carotenoid known to far more than beta carotene or lutein or zeaxanthin, anything, any one of those. So it really protects eye health too in the retina. Now, we just talked about so much, and I know the families are probably writing notes faster than they could listen, because <laughs> I knew even me, I was writing notes as you were talking as well. I'm like, ooh, that's a good one. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I, you know, I like to provide new information, yeah. I love new information, and I think that for parents listening, you know, I've been in the autism community going on 13 years, and, you know, for me, when I hear new information, which it's, it's constantly coming out, it's just where we're going to find it and who do we trust, right? Um, yeah, but, that's the key. you know, what that reminds me of is that there's hope. You know, we're, we're not, this is not an end-all, be-all. It's, okay, guys, we got to keep looking. we got to keep researching. we got to keep finding the right people to talk to. And so I'm so grateful that we found the right people to talk to, like yourself. And, you know, what are maybe two or three things, like we talked about a lot, that maybe leaving the families with, um, you know, maybe next step, easy steps, and, and what message do you want to leave with them? Well, I think reinforced the one you said, there is hope. I mean, it really is. I mean, I, I've seen so many children re, regain their life and return to normalcy and essentially lead a full, a full normal life. So it's not necessarily easy, as you well know, but you can do it. So stick in there. You know, don't give up. Don't give up hope would be the, probably the primary message. Second would be uh, to optimize, optimize the diet. Of course, I'm biased. It's my, you know, to eat real food, stay away from processed foods and sugars. And if, you, if you're interested in fine-tuning, then pick up a copy of my book, Fat for Fuel, which goes into the ketogenic diet and great details how to implement it and you know, specific strategies, especially if someone has cancer. That is really essential in my view. But then to optimize the light exposure. You know, the light, is, is, light exposure is almost as important as, as eating the right foods. So stay away from artificial lights, um, you know, wear the blue blockers at night, uh, and, you know, get some incandescent bulbs that the ones you use at night, are a key to, and expose yourself to sunshine. Uh, because, you know, I'm not a big fan of taking, I've ne- in fact, I haven't taken vitamin D supplements in almost 10 years, and I have a very healthy vitamin D level because I expose myself to the sun, which is hard to do in the winter, of course, but, you know, you're taking... Oral supplemental vitamin D may be useful, but it's only last resort. You really want to get it from that's that's the key. Uh, and then movement. I mean, if they're not, I mean, they obviously most kids don't need a formal exercise program, but again, as long as they're moving, I mean, that's what that's what exercise is supposed to be anyway. It's just a movement throughout the day. This whole time I've been talking to you, I've been walking throughout my house. I put in like two, three thousand steps. So because your body is designed for, you're not designed to sit down all day. I mean, that's that's disastrous. So. And, and will definitely impair metabolic health. So I think that's, that, that's a good summary. Now oh, I feel yeah, guilty. Wait, wait. I've, I've, been most, sitting, most, I've been sitting. You've been walking. What? I could have been doing Yeah, I've been walking the whole time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, but then remember the EMF exposures that we talked about early on yeah. initially. So that's, that's key because, you know, you can poo-poo it, but, you know, your, your biology is not, I can assure you. If you. You've got to optimize that. In fact, many of these steps will not work unless you remove the EMF, the pathogenic uh, EMF in influence on the body. So it's really important. Well, where do people, um, I know you had said over 30 million a month visit your site. How do, how do we get, you know, people listening today, if they haven't been to your site, um, what is your site and how do they find it? Yeah, that was unique visitors, so I mean, different people. Yeah. Um, that would be Mercola.com, my last name. I was an early adopter. I, I actually started my website before Google started theirs. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> was, so it's, been, it's been around a while, Mercola, M-E-R-C-O-L-A.com. And we've got a daily newsletter, and you know, we don't specifically focus on autism. We focus on challenges, the environment, regenerative agriculture, vaccines. Every Tuesday we talk about some of those things and uh, fitness and, you know, basically some of the fraud and deception manipulation that these corporate influences are trying to pull off on you and get away with. And we, we take the covers off of that and expose the lies and help people understand what the reality is. Well, and I think it's important, as we talked about earlier, to find, you know, uh, trusted sources. And you're definitely a trusted source. I, I have so much respect for you. And your book, you said, comes out in mid-May. Uh, so mm-hmm. definitely um, people can, I'm assuming, go to the bookstores and Amazon and probably on your website as well. Yeah. 
No, no, it's just, uh, it's just on Amazon. We don't sell on our site. We may in oh, the future, okay. but okay. Totally not, not, maybe not until this, this fall or something. Gotcha. So Amazon and the bookstores, guys, go buy his book. And um, thank you so much. I mean, at, at the very end of the day, we definitely have some great uh, tools here. And, you know, guys, don't, don't give up on hope. I mean, there's so much new coming out, and we just have to, like we talked about, look at the right places to find it. So um, thanks so much, Dr. McCullough, for taking time in your busy day to help so many families out there. All right, Kristen. Happy to do that.